Afternoon and welcome. My name is Pete Gade. I'm uh, with Library Labs, and this is Tom Gallagher, who is also with Library Labs. Uh, we're a digital agency here in Seattle, and we're joined today by uh, Meredith Hahn and Catherine LaFranchise from uh, Brooks and from Urban Decay, respectively. And we're here to talk today about brand is focus, branding advice that's straight up for startups. And just a little bit about that topic before we get into it really. Um, you know, why startups? Well, this is something that we, we really see a lot of value in startups um, that they provide, as well as the opportunity you have to start your branding off fresh because uh, you're still small, you still have a lot of control over it, and frankly, it's not screwed up yet. Um, as far as the straight up part, you know, we're just here to give you some practical advice. We're not here to do a lot of song and dance. Um, just something you can use as you start building your brand and really your business by extension. I'm there for you. So really that's why we're here. The question then is why are you here? Um, and what I mean by this is, you know, what has sparked you down the path that has led you here today? What's the reason you're doing what you're doing? Um, to keep things simple today, we're going to just assume that everybody here is involved in some way in a startup. Really a little more specific even that you're involved in some level in the leadership of the startup. Maybe you're even there at the, the genesis of the idea. That being the case, in one form or another, one day you woke up uh, and started listening to the voices in your head. And these voices said things like, wow, I can't believe no one's done this yet. I'm jumping on that. Or I could really do a much better job of this thing. Or people are going to line up around the block and I'll be able to cash out in a few years and retire. Or this is the thing I'm meant to do. Whatever it is, you saw an opportunity to do something new, something better, something that people could really, really use, or just something that maybe they'll one day come to love. So you took that leap. You started building your business, and as you did that, you started building something of a business philosophy. Now, whether this is expressed or whether it's just innate to the way you operate doesn't really matter. Somewhere there's a set of principles, a set of ideals, a set of methods that directs how you do business. In short, with that idea and the way you operate, you have a vision. Now that vision is what we're here to talk about today because that vision forms the foundation of your brand. Your brand is already building itself, whether you know it or not. Now that may lead you to one of two polar opposite reactions, the first being, oh, great, I've already started building my brand, no problem. Or two, oh crap, I've already started building my brand, what am I doing? Now whichever those reactions is, it's not important, you've got plenty of time to fix it. Um, or to ride it out, but what's important to understand is that everything you do has some impact on your brand. Every business interaction, communication, decision you make in some way is going to affect the way people perceive you and that brand. Now, you might be thinking already that you agree with this and you're on for the ride. Maybe you're a little skeptical. You're just saying, well, branding is really just, you know, that's the name on the sign, that's the paint on the outside of the building. What does that have to do with who I choose for a manufacturer or who I choose for a development partner? That's a great question because <clears throat> really the way we're talking about brand and maybe you kind of see this coming, we're talking about it in a much broader sense. And namely the idea is that brand is much more than a logo or a tagline or your PowerPoint template, we get a lot of that, um, or marketing. Really it's something bigger than that. And there's a great definition, uh, a prevailing definition of brand that's really been uh, gaining a lot of traction. And one reason why it's been gaining so much traction is because it's common sense. So this is the way we're talking about brand today, just to set things up for us. It goes something like this. Brand is the gut feeling that people have about your product, your service, or your company. And it's really only human nature that people form opinions and that people are going to be forming an opinion about your company. Um, they might even be forming one about your company right now. And over time, that opinion is going to coalesce, coalesce into something a little greater, that gut feeling, that brand feeling. So when we talk about this gut level feeling, it can have a really profound level of influence over your business over the long term. It's going to influence the top talent that you're looking to attract. It's going to influence the investors that you're seeking. And then ultimately, it's going to influence the customers that you really want to keep. So from that standpoint, your brand really is a business asset. 
Because if you think of it in those terms, really if people are feeling optimistic and positive about your business on a gut level, they're going to be more inclined to do business with you and recommend you to their friends. This isn't just opinion. You could take a look at some of the research that's conducted by uh, Forrester Research. They do a survey every year. And what they've consistently found is where companies uh, perform very well in so-called customer experience, the way they interact with their customers, if that number is high, they find out that there's a natural correlation between that and, again, the willingness of somebody to do business with that company time and time again and to make a recommendation. So you might be saying, okay, great, you know, you're talking about brand in this very broad level. Well, how do we, how do we get there? Well, it really is through your actions across the entirety of your business to take this vision that you have right now and to execute against it tactically, daily, across the entirety of your business and for the long term. I'm going to stick on this slide for just a minute. Um, just because I want to reiterate, Pete mentioned a couple of things there that, that really play out and are very important. The first is that brand, again, is a business asset. And the second being that your entire organization is responsible for delivering on this, for upholding it, for maintaining it. And that being the case, it's not really something that can be just spun up out of thin air by a marketing department or an agency. What's here on the quote on the screen, sorry, is a, a very long quote from Brand Z. Now they're a, a brand equity database, and there's really two of them, them an inner brand in the world. And what they do is try to assign value, tangible financial value to brands. Um, they go around the world every year, talk to consumers and professionals, and basically take a survey on, on brand the sentiments about the brands and try again to assign value to them. Um, and what they did when they did this last year, and they, they found a common thread between the top 10, this is the top 10 most valuable brands in the world. So these are very large, very successful companies. And the thread that they're mentioning here is that each of these was built by a visionary leader who had a, a strong understanding of brand and took that and baked it into the business from the beginning. So it wasn't something that was spray painted on later. This was there at the very early stages in the foundations. Now, if you're in the leadership of a startup today, you have an opportunity to be that leader for your company. Again, you have a vision. Brand can help give focus to that vision. And now is really the best time in your startup's life to take that vision and to coalesce it and express it in a brand. By doing that, now you still have a really strong and clear sense of what that vision is. You're still small enough that you can control what you do and how you do it. And once you do that, you will then have this, this well-articulated tool that you can use to help guide the growth of your business. So that sounds great. You can use brand to help build your business. The question being then, how do you build your brand? Now, we've broken down our, again, practical long-term, make no doubts about it, this is long-term advice, uh, into a manageable five key points today that we're going to walk through each of them. We'll tell you what we mean by them, why we think they're important, and we're going to, most importantly, look at some examples of how these play out for real businesses in the real world. Pete and I will talk to a couple of case studies, and we have our friends here from Brooks and Urban Decay to give you some first-hand experience on how this works. So, where do we start? You start by being real. It's really where the, uh, all this branding process really begins, rooting yourself in reality. And it's a good opportunity to sort of level set here and say that really your business and your brand are the same thing. Um, businesses can't hide behind marketing anymore. You can't put up that veneer that, ta that Tom was talking about. Um, well, you can, but it's eventually going to catch up with you because people are going to sniff that out. Um, the reality of it is, or one way to think of it is, that your business is essentially out there making a promise to people. And if you consistently make good on that, pro make good on that promise, people are going to be feeling, well, very positive about you. And if you don't make good on that promise, well, you're going to get hammered. Uh, let the Facebook wars and the Facebook flames begin. Uh, that's where some problems can occur. The important thing here is to recognize this is the reality of the digital marketplace that you're entering today. Reputation is everything, and that's another way you can think about brand collectively. If you take all these gut-level feelings that people have, that adds up to your reputation. So it's very important at this point to be 
very real about who you are, what you do, what you do really well, and who you're doing it for. The good news is that you've probably already been thinking about things that way. As one of the charter members of your organization or the founder yourself, there's this vision that we've been talking about, this philosophy, this, this idea that you have that's very close to you. Great. Now, the trick is, or the next step rather is, to see yourself as the world sees you. That's another way of reminding ourselves that, hey, this big idea that you have about your business isn't necessarily about you. It's ultimately about your customer and what they get out of your business, what benefit they see from it. What we have up here are a number of questions that can help, uh, help us see through the customer's eyes. They are reflective of some, of some research that was put together by Carnegie Mellon uh, University oh, about 20 years ago. And what they do is they essentially give you a very good idea of what's on the mind of your customer and what's important to them on a gut level. And more importantly, beyond going through these questions and just answering them to arrive at a great messaging framework or a great pitch, really what it gives you is a hypothesis, something that your business can put forward and put to the test as you develop. As you take a look at all these questions, you can see how when we start to answer them, it adds up to that gut level feeling that we're talking about on that top level brand level. And how there's a rational component to it and there's an emotional component to it. Now it's very easy to drain the deck here and I'm not gonna put us through that pain. Uh, but I do wanna touch on these questions very quickly because they're gonna give you some great insight into the way uh, we're taking a look at some of the brands today, and it's also a great critical filter as you assess your competition moving forward. So beginning on sort of that rational side here, uh, you can ask yourself, well, what is it you're doing? What category are you in? Uh, and what function do you provide within that category? Looking at it through the consumer lens, how do they see you stacking up on that feature by feature level? The next one is who are you doing it for? You've probably already been taking a look at your market opportunity, a broad market segment, but your challenge here is to get to know your customer down on a very uh, microscopic, microscopic uh, persona-based level, a research-based view of who your customer is and understand what, they, what a day in their life looks like, what uh, they do from hour to hour, what their needs are, what their challenges are, what their desires are. Now, kind of moving over into that emotional spectrum here, you have to answer the question of what's in it for them? On that benefit level, what benefit do they get out of it? Again, reminding ourselves that it's very important here to answer the question from their perspective. We all have an idea of what our benefit of our company is. Great, but let's ask the customer. Let's find out what they believe the benefit is. And this is a tremendous and insightful part of this exercise because you can really discover some very interesting differences in opinion and some nuances that can provide some correction as you build your business and go to reach out to these customers. And then ultimately we get on up to the why will they feel it's special? This is that pinnacle, that gut level feeling that we've been talking about, that when time and time again these people interact with you and your business and they receive that benefit again and again and again, what's that impression that it ultimately makes? What's that one thing that when your, company mind, uh, when your company name comes to mind, they say, that's what they do. This is the place where they absolutely kill it. And I'm gonna stick with them because of that. You're gonna see some great examples of that from uh, Meredith and Catherine here uh, very shortly with uh, Brooks and Urban Decay. But in the meantime, I wanna point you to a blog article uh, that you should definitely check out. Uh, came out earlier this month and it's put together by uh, John Lusk. A number of you may be familiar with John. He's a local art entrepreneur and author, and he's also the founder of Rivet and Sway. It's a new fashion eyewear brand for women. And the reason why we're pointing out this article is because uh, John does a great job of taking this sort of theoret theoretical framework that I just talked about and puts it to work in the practical space in very direct and practical terms and very well-written article in 10 minutes time you can see how John took this same kind of approach and went from a sort of amorphous kind of idea right on down into a very targeted market opportunity, 
a targeted audience, right on down into, hey, what price point do I charge for uh, my eyewear here? As you know, uh, coming up with uh, price points can be a very difficult and challenging thing. John breaks it down. It's a really great read. It's up on uh, johnlusk.net. It came out earlier this month, so if you just kind of skim around there for the uh, first week of October, check it out. Once again, it's a great story about how this business got very real about what it did, what it did well, for who it did it, and built a really focused brand around it. Okay, so you found this focus now. You have a, a pretty good idea of who you are, what you're gonna do, how you wanna be perceived. Great, what do you do with that? Take that focus and crank it up. Now, you need to do this in, in two different directions, really. One of them is taking that focus and turning it into the promise that you're going to make to your, your audience and hone that down to a fine point so that when that connects with someone, it immediately connects with them. It doesn't just bounce off. They don't not quite understand what it is. You don't have a lot of time to make an impression with someone. You've got to connect with them right away. The second thing you're going to do is make that promise felt in every single thing you do. Here's another quote from our friends at Brand Z. Um, again, just something that they've found in assessing the, the ups and downs of the brand value world market. Um, it says, strong emotional brand messages must be matched by superb product delivery. Failure to provide an experience which lives up to the brand promise is the fastest way to destroy brand trust and value. Now, this is all great and good coming from Brand Z, off in their ivory tower, wherever that is. Um, but it's not just something that they're spouting off out there. In the most recent, last year's um, annual board of directors survey, which surveys board members from around the world, two-thirds of board members listed reputation as their number one concern, the number one thing they were most concerned about protecting from damage, upholding, and furthering. Um, there's that word reputation again. So reputation is, I mean, what is that really if not the promises you make and the way you deliver on them? So once you find that intersection of what your customer needs and what you can really do very well, that's your promise, take that and deliver on it at every possible touch point, from the messaging in advertising and communications to the design and UX of websites and apps to hiring processes, sourcing, um, the business relationships you build onto the way you handle customer service and getting flamed on Twitter. Um, <laughs> Really, you just have to continue to deliver on this at every possible point. So what does this look like when a company does this for real? We think Zipcar is a great example of a company that takes this promise and delivers on it at every possible opportunity and has seen, obviously, huge success as a result. Wheels when you want them is their tagline that they put out there for, for marketing purposes, but it's also their promise. And it's not just a functional promise. I mean, it does say you get a car, it's easy, it's convenient, there's some emotional connection here. It says wheels when you want them, not a car when you need it. So they're also saying it's fun, you have spontaneity. This is something that you can get excited and, and connect with. So how do they deliver on this throughout every touch point with a customer? We're gonna take a look back at the four questions that Pete just talked about and see how Zipcar maps back to those. So first of all, what are they doing? I mean, for broad speaking terms, they're really just a, a car rental company. They're in that category. A little more specifically, they're really car sharing. You know, they have a fleet of thousands of cars placed throughout urban neighborhoods around the world for rent for as, as little as an hour. Okay, sounds like a good, good business idea. Who are they doing this for? They're doing it for people who think owning a car is too expensive, it's too much of a hassle, maybe philosophically they just don't want to have another car and be responsible for putting another one on the road. Whatever it is, there's a group of people out there who have a need for a car every now and then for an hour here, a few hours there, but not a day or days at a time. What's in it for these people? Savings, convenience. Basically, they get the freedom of owning a car without the burden of owning a car. They just hop online, book the car, walk down the street, flash their card on the windshield, hop in, and they're gone. Gas insurance is all taken care of. The car is clean and maintained by the Zipcar crew for a few dollars here and there, pretty much on demand, wheels when they want them. It's exactly what they get. But why do they feel it's special? What's the feeling they get out of this? Now, Zipcar has gone so far as to create an identity for their customers. They call them Zipsters. Now, whether 
their customers embrace this or not, whether their customers call themselves or not, isn't really what's important. It's the essence that they're communicating with that identity. It's saying, I'm hip, I'm urban, I'm trendy, I'm energetic, I'm spontaneous, I can come and go and do what I want as I please. So that's all expressed there, and they deliver on this to a fault at every possible opportunity. Again, I just mentioned that you know, the car has gas, the insurance is taken care of, it's clean, it's maintained, all of these functional things that make it easy, make it convenient, and make it something that you can just jump into and do. But they go so far as to give every car in their fleet a name, whether it's Edna or Little Green or whatever the names are, this is thousands of cars. When you reserve a car and you go pick it up, you know the name of that car. So that gives you some emotional connection to the company, some emotional connection to that car, and something that you can really own and be a part of. And it makes you love them all the more. So figuring out who you are and what you want to do is, is great. That's a, a large chunk of what you need to do, but it's only part of it. Execution is everything. Brand strategy is just a strategy. It's just a plan until you deliver on it. So you have to deliver on it tactically, passionately, and daily. You need to keep instilling that gut feeling again and again and again at every opportunity. Brings up our uh, next point about empathy and the ability to empathize with your audience and why that's so important. Because when you show your audience a tremendous level of understanding, very similar to the way that Tom was talking about Zipcar, you put yourself in a very strong position to potentially gain a lot of customer loyalty in return. When you go to market in that fashion, this is something that really can and will set you apart. Again, let's go back to that definition of what brand is, that gut level feeling that we've been talking about and how there's a rational component to it and an emotional component to it. You really do need to have both because if you neglect bringing in that emotional component, people are gonna feel like something is missing. And really, that's human nature to acknowledge that people really seek to make out a connection on an emotional level. People, well, put it this way, like attracts like. People are consistently seeking out like-minded institutions, individuals, brands, etc., who are sharing a worldview of theirs, who see the world in a very similar fashion to the way they do. Again, this is human nature. And if you, as a business, can bake that in to the way that you actually interact with your customers and deliver on it, you're going to give them something potentially very powerful that's additional that they're going to be able to glom onto. And that's an idea. So again, we've been talking about brand from a business standpoint. This is more than just good marketing. This is good business, to be able to find this feeling and stick with it and have it inform everything you do. And I'm looking over at Meredith because it's time to introduce her because Brooks is such an excellent example of playing out this, uh, this belief in practice. Come on up. So hello, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Meredith Hahn. I'm the head of e-commerce at Brooks Sports. And um, like a lot of you, my background's actually more in the technology and the e-commerce side. So I was a little bit of a fish out of water moving to a footwear company five years ago. Um, but I've actually learned quite a few things kind of in this brand realm that I'll take with me well beyond Brooks. Um, and it's primarily around realizing that customers make decisions both on a rational basis, um, but also on an emotional side. And I'm a little bit of a data geek, uh, analytical type person that plays well in the technology space. Um, but you know, there's a whole different world out there that you can tap into and, and to really build a business, you've got to address both the rational decision making of customers um, and the emotional side. So um, just to give you a little bit of history on Brooks, we're actually here in Seattle, um, if you didn't know. Uh, I, lived, I lived here for quite a while before I, I knew that, but we are a local company. Um, and going back to the 90s, uh, Brooks was in five or six different product categories. We were probably fifth or sixth brand in each of them, profitable in none of them. Um, we went through a series of owners, a series of CEOs, and we were about this far from being bankrupt. And then in 2001, our current CEO, Jim Weber, came in and said, this company needs a reset. Um, and he laid out for, uh, for the company a vision to really try to own the run. 
And what that meant to us is that we were going to build quality product for runners. Uh, most of what we would all call running shoes is actually never run in, and there's a great business there. Nike sells billions of dollars worth of fashion footwear running shoes. But we wanted to build high quality technical performance gear um, for runners. And the, the heart and soul of that on the sales side is really um, what we call the running specialty channel. So in Seattle, it's stores like Super Jock and Jill or Fleet Feet. This is where the enthusiasts shop. And we said, hey, if we can build um, great product that's going to resonate in that sales channel and win over those enthusiasts, that's going to be the core of a, a really strong business that we'll be able to build on from there. Um, it was also just kind of a realization that particularly for a niche brand um, in, a, in a crowded space with a lot of great product out there, you've got to have some center of gravity to, to rely on. And so in, in the sporting world, we look at brands like Lululemon, um, probably the hottest brand in the fitness space. Like they are rooted in the yoga studio. Somebody like Patagonia, um, you, you might think of like being on the mountainside or a, a kind of environmental stewardship as being really core to what they do. And for Brooks, it's, it's all about the run. And so um, we, we often will think that sort of a physical manifestation of this, if you're just sort of to imagine a place, might be the, you know, the start of the Seattle Rock and Roll Marathon. That is kind of a, just a, a physical embodiment of what we're talking about here. Um, on the business side, whoo, it built. Uh, <laughs> on the business side, uh, internally what we talk about is really having a three-legged strategy. And the first two are very much in that um, kind of rational, this is sort of how runners think they make decisions and, and do. You know, it's product leadership and service is key for all of our businesses. Um, you know, like, like these guys were saying, you're, you're not going to win a category if you've got bad product and bad service. It's just a given. Um, but the third layer that we try to layer on top of that is what we call run happy. And that's really about um, celebrating the running spirit in everything we do. And we use it as a filter for everything that um, touches the end consumer to how we communicate with them, to how we show up at events, to who we hire, to how we answer the phone. Um, whatever we're trying to do and put out there, we try to put through that, through that um, lens. So just to give you a few examples, um, the key competitor in our space for us is ASICS. Um, they have great product, but here's an example of uh, you know, showing up at a major a marathon. When they, when they show up, they, they pretty much show up. They've got stuff there. Um, you know, when we show up, we try to show up big. And so we, <laughs> this is actually a 53 foot inflatable rocker guy that we have out on the, uh, the race course at all the Seattle, or all the rock and roll marathons that we're out at. Um, over on the right, we've got our, our most recent booth from the Chicago Marathon. It was a giant pasta bowl. And so um, we don't just show up. If we're going to bother coming at all, we've got um, a limited number of places we can be at. We want to make an impression with the runners. And so, um, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to miss going through the rocker guy's legs when you're out on the course. Um, it carries over into uh, other aspects of, of our business. So on the athlete side, we sponsor a ton of great athletes, but um, it's always put through that lens. We're not looking just for the fastest runners out there. Um, Chrissy Wellington is a four-time Ironman world champion who's a Brooks athlete, so amazing athlete, but she's um, just as well known within that world for just having a larger than life personality and somebody who really celebrates being fit and active and that just uh, resonates really well with, with what we're trying to communicate. And then in, in terms of product advertising in our space, you'll see a lot of um, very technical focused, um, we call them big shoe ads, um, both digitally and in print. It's, it's generally speaking, it's pretty cut and dry, product, product, product. And we, we try to touch on sort of the emotional feel that you're gonna get from using the product. Um, and we build our communications around that. Um, so that's, that's really it from the Brooks side. I mean, we internally, um, we're kind of wrapping up our 11th year of record setting growth since we did that reset. And um, for us, building a great business is really synonymous with, with building a great brand. Um, we're actually a little mi minor spec of Berkshire Hathaway. So Warren Buffett is ultimately the owner of the company. And, he has some um, fun quotes in this realm that we try to reflect back on. He says, you know, if, if your brand can be stronger at the end of the year than the beginning of the year, you're, you're doing your job. 
And when in balancing investment to drive growth and profits, like you've got to put the health of the brand first. So we always try to try to keep that in mind. Um, so kind of to all the data geeks, like myself included, don't forget the, the soft, warm, and fuzzy side because it has real, real business value. Thank you, Meredith. So, as you can see from, from what she just walked through now, maybe saying, well, Brooks, they're not a startup, but at some point they were. Um, and really, given the reboot just a few years back, they, they essentially you know, started fresh um, and figured out who they were going to be and, and what they were going to do. So they really did map to some of these earlier principles that you're seeing, where they, they found their focus and, and how to empathize with their audience. And they've really cranked that up as an example from the, the pasta bowl and the rock and roll spread legged runner guy. Um, they've taken that out to, to every little corner and nook and cranny that they can. And it makes that emotional connection that much stronger because you feel it at every single point. So say you've done all of these first few things, you've got your focus, you've delivered on it at every possible point, you're empathizing with your audience and making that connection, things are just going gangbusters. Awesome. Stay on strategy. Stay true to your vision. Now, you've become known for doing something really, really well. Keep doing that thing. Now, this isn't to say that you can't change and you can't grow because as you do well, new opportunities are going to show up and they're going to provide you with, with channels for growth. You're going to be able to experiment with new features and new experiences for existing and new customers. And you should do those things. It's not to say, you know, just keep doing your one thing and, and head down that road forever. But you need some sort of filter to decide what you should do and what you shouldn't do. Brand can be that decision-making filter. You heard Meredith mention that as well. It can be the thing that helps you decide, is this right for us? Because if you make a move or two that isn't right for your customers, they're going to let you know. Does anybody <laughs> need a refresh on, on what happened last year with Netflix? No, I didn't think so. OK. Um, so an extreme example, but a good illustration of the point. And again, the world is going to change around you, and you have to adapt to it. Um, in order to survive. There's just, there's no question about that. It's not saying don't change. It's just saying think about how you change and do it in a way that is right for who you are, right for who people understand you to be, and right for what they expect from you. That way, amidst all of this change that is undoubtedly going to happen, you can become a point of comfort and consistency for those customers. They'll know what to expect from you and they will come back and turn to you time and time again. So speaking to this idea of staying true to your original vision and your principles and succeeding through all kinds of change, I would like to introduce Catherine the Franchise from Urban Decay. Hello, everyone. Um, so Urban Decay is a cosmetics brand, for those of you not familiar. Um, and it's got a real rocker edge, edge that's uh, part of our heritage and totally core to our DNA. Um, but we've also been able to really appeal to the everyday woman who just wants to look pretty. And we've been able to do that all without totally losing our soul. Um, so one of the great things about this brand is um, we've really evolved it in such a way that's pretty inspirational to a lot of other people. Um, our founder, Wendy Zomner, started the brand 16 years ago, and she started it with uh, a line of nail polishes. And there was five in the original line, and they were all a varying shade of black. Um, and she also had a similar range of lipsticks, although one of those was actually blue. So obviously not super accessible to the everyday woman. Um, but one of the things that she had the vision for very early on was that in order for the brand to sustain itself, it was going to have to become far more universally appealing. So um, she went about doing that in a couple of different ways. One of those ways was through developing the formulations so that they're really highly efficacious. So uh, formulas that actually did something good for you. Um, also, she looked at the packaging, and there was no real interesting packaging out in the market in those days. So um, she also really made sure that we had uh, really high innovation in our packaging, and we still have some 
some of the most interesting packaging out in the market today, but um, probably what was most relevant to most women and what we became really known for was our extreme color range. So we've gotten to be known in the industry as um, the brand that has the most expansive shade range. Um, so just to give an example, um, in our single eyeshadow range, we have 68 shades, which is far more than uh, most in our competitive set. And those range anywhere from a super innocent uh, vanilla highlighter to a what we call a totally iconic jolting hot pink that's only worn by a select few people. Um, not every woman is going to wear that, but it is one of the things that we've become known for as a brand. Um, so our brand can really be summarized well um, just by taking a look at um, our tagline, uh, which is beauty with an edge. So that really tells you a lot about who we are. But I think the most important thing and a, a key takeaway here um, is that, yes, we're a brand that um, evokes the idea of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. We always have. We probably always will with shade names like chronic, smoked, and perversion as part of our uh, core in line skews. But um, along with our tagline, one thing that we do really well that's really important to us is everything that we do as a brand um, must be put through a set of filters. So um, core to everything we do, whether it be product or marketing, it's got to meet criteria and three key components. Um, the first being that, that it's got to be feminine. Um, Second, it's got to be a little bit dangerous, which is probably one of our favorites. And third, it's got to be fun. So if something comes um, you know, out from product development and it's going to hit the roadmap and actually go through the process, it's got to meet those criteria and it's got to go through those filters. So if I can leave you with anything today, it's have some kind of filtering system that you align everything in your business to. Um, so you know the. Knowing the essence of our brand um, and that we're 16 years old, um, one of the things that's really revolutionized our business in the last two years is um, a launch of a new line of products called Naked, and most specifically the Naked Palette. So two years ago, we really shook, shook up the business and the industry when we launched this Naked Palette. Um, and what's interesting about Naked is that it's a line of neutrals, um, which almost flies in the face of the original brand ethos, which was pretty blatantly anti-neutral. Um, but the way that we did this and did it successfully is by really doing it the urban decay way. So what that means for us is still keeping this neutral palette very sexy um, and kind of shimmery and having shade names like Sin and Virgin as some of the inline skews in the palette. Um, and by doing that, we had an overnight hit on our hands that's actually totally revolutionized our business. Um, and we're very proud of the fact that the Naked Palette's actually the number one selling uh, palette of all time, and that's across all beauty brands. Um, so more, more importantly, or not more, but for me as a marketer, one of the things that's really been interesting about this launch is that the Naked Palette um, has really changed our customer profile. So customers coming into the brand through Naked are higher spend, and they have a much higher retention rate over time than any of the other products um, that we have in our line. So what that means for us is really being able to onboard these customers. We're bringing in the most desirable customer. We're onboarding them. And then we're upselling them and cross-selling them um, to the other products within the line. So again, it's just really revolutionized our business. And we've done naked, or neutrals rather, but we've done it in a way that's really um, stayed true to our brand. Um, so the bottom line really is that people know what to expect from Urban Decay. Um, we've had phenomenal brand consistency over time, um, but we've not ever sold out. Um, we've had the ability to constantly evolve. Um, we find that our customers, when asked, still 
you know, will respond that they come to us for the expansive uh, shade range that we offer. Um, but we also find that one of the things that's really, really important is we provide them a feeling and a connotation, and that's of edginess. Um, so we've created three key customer personas from our, you know, what we found in our database, and one of those is actually a 40-year-old woman, um, and we find that, you know, the 40-year-old soccer mom who doesn't necessarily have a lot of time to go out and know what's edgy and what's cool, like, she can come to us and we can kind of be her tastemaker. We can tell her what's on trend. And so it goes a long way for her that she can be sort of rock and, you know, rock and roll on a Saturday night by creating a smoky eye with her perversion pencil. So, um, <laughs> and interestingly, you know, like I said before, although people say that they still come to us because of the expansive shade shade range that we offer, um, when analyzed, most of our sales are actually in blacks and browns, so really basic colors. Um, but more importantly, we've done a ton of research in the last couple years, and what we've learned is that as long as we continue to offer that color range and we continue to be true to feminine, dangerous, and fun, um, that we have her permission to do neutrals without being seen as selling out, which we're really hyper aware of. Um, so we feel like this um, is really the perfect scenario for us and gives us a ton of runway as a brand. Home stretch. So one of the last things we want to talk about today is this idea of brand is legacy, that it's something that you pass on, just in the way that uh, Catherine was talking about. Urban Decay has been around for more than 15 years, and it started out with a founder's vision, and that vision has perpetuated over time and will continue to perpetuate. So let's take it, to back, or let's take it back to where you are right now. The fact of the matter is that you can't do everything yourself. And here we're acknowledging the fact that at this point in the development of your business, a lot is probably going through your two hands right now. You're probably doing sales, you're probably doing marketing, there's operations, and there's, oh yeah, there's that product or service that we're supposed to be going to market with too, yeah. So all these things are going through your hands right now, and that's great on some level, because that vision, that, um, that idea that got you started is informing everything that you do right now. Your thumbprint is on all these things. But there's going to come a day where you're going to have to step back and let go. And of course, when you do that, the rest of your organization is going to be responsible for delivering on this promise and these values and this vision at every possible point. So by capturing that vision and expressing it in a brand, you provide your growing organization with the tool they need, with something they can hold on to that says, this is why we're here, this is what we're supposed to be doing. And they can use that in every different customer interaction they have and every different decision they make about how the business moves forward. Eventually, you're not necessarily going to have contact with every single person that you hire on. They need to have something, both individually and as a giant organization, that they can come back and huddle around and say, this is who we are. So taking a look at a more midterm view here, looking down the road in three to five years, there are a number of very likely scenarios that can occur for your business. You can grow through acquisition, you can sell, or you can continue down this path that you're on right now by simply growing organically. And let's just take a quick look at how this idea of brand is legacy plays out across each one of these. The first one is growing through acquisition. And here in this scenario, it's vitally important that everybody is going to have a very hard and fast idea of what that vision is. This brings up an example of a client of ours that we've done some work for recently, a company called Game House. And they are a casual gaming brand who grew very, very rapidly through international acquisition. They have offices in North America, South America, Europe, and they have this terrific fan base and this huge catalog of games. When they came to us, the thing that they didn't have was this vision. The head of the organization said to us, you know, when people wake up and come to work here in the morning, 
not everybody agrees why we're doing that. Everybody had a slightly different idea about what Game House was about. Well, the good news for Game House was that those visions of what they were out there to do, who they were doing it for, and what was special about the organization weren't all that wildly different from each other. And also, to their benefit, uh, what customers felt about them wasn't all that wildly different. They were very lucky in that regard. It really just took a bit of time, a bit of energy, to get people to rally around this idea, to focus up, and to build this brand that uh, we've been talking about today and drop down that standard. So the note here is that it's going to be very important in these acquisition scenarios to be able to say, here's what we're on about, here's our mission, here's what we're doing, here's what we're doing, who, who we're doing it for, here's what's special about it, and here's where you fit in. Here's why we're bringing you on board, because you complement us, you make us better at that. Likewise, the same thing occurs for the parent company, so that people in the parent company, when there's an acquisition scenario on the horizon, they can say, oh yeah, makes total sense, these guys are going to make us better. Get this done now rather than later because you really can't put, your uh, put yourself in a position of risk if you don't. Now, speaking on the flip side of that, you yourself may be acquired, you may sell. Now, whether this is part of your exit strategy in a few years or whether it, if the right price comes along, you're, you're willing to jump. What's important to understand is that the acquiring company is going to look at you through a variety of different filters, and those include all of the usual things like market and strategy and finances. They're also going to look at you through a lens including brand, and this is so that they can assess two things, both, again, the tangible value that brand adds to a business, both in the strength of that business and the connection with their customers, as well as in just any equity that that brand is actually carrying. The other thing, again, is this idea of cultural compatibility. A company who's going to purchase someone else, they want to make sure that there's a good fit here, that that makes sense for them, that it will foster their own mission and their own vision, and that there won't be a lot of uh, cacophony and discord once those two organizations are brought together. So just quickly, I'd like to look at Zappos as an example of this. Now, clearly they went through big years, had tons of success, and then were eventually bought by Amazon. Now, one of the key things you can see by the strength of their brand is that even after being bought by Amazon, they're still Zappos. Um, so that that's, says a lot because Amazon you know, could have just swallowed them up and tried to wrap them into their own thing, but they would have lost a lot of that inherent brand equity, that tangible financial value. The other thing is that they were able to see that there was a cultural compatibility here. Now, Zappos, if you've ever done business with them, you know that they've basically taken customer service to such a high level that they don't even really need customer service. Amazon is also a customer service oriented company. They do it in a little bit of a different way, but there's an inherent cultural compatibility there that made them a good fit. So they were able to look at Zappos, see the strength of the brand, see the fit of the brand, and make a good purchase. And the last one is that uh, you may simply grow organically. And in a lot of ways, this is you right now. How does this legacy work out? Well, again, it's putting that standard forward and being able to use it as a way to act like a magnet for top talent, to be able to say, here's why it's so important that you come on board, because we have a very specific direction. You have a very specific skill set. Match made in heaven. Let's go, go forward together. Same thing from spinning up new business units. The way we've been talking about brand today is to uh, execute against this vision, this brand idea across all your touch points. As you spin up a new business unit, you're going to be able to say, here's your role in that. You perform a business function, but you also perform a brand function. And we can be very clear about that from the start. And then likewise, the same thing can apply to the partnerships that you may spin up. Very similar to the acquisition into the sales scenarios. Here's where our two businesses go very well together. This just underscores, again, a lot what we've been talking about and a lot what's going on for you right now. That really brand is focus, and that focus begins at the top with all y'all. You have an opportunity to get this established right now and use it in the way that Urban Decay and Brooks have been using it and some of these other examples to really use it as this decision-making filter and as a living, breathing extension of your business strategy. So again, in the interest of being practical, we'll take one last look at those five key points. Um, again, these aren't, this isn't some five quick-step process to building a great global brand and it, 
eternal happiness and peace. This is just some bullet points, um, but we think they outline some, some good practical long-term advice, and make no mistake, obviously there's a lot that you have to do, but surely you know that. Um, and think, keeping these things in mind along with the, the sort of rough thought exercise that we went to today, we think there are some things that as you set out to do the work of building your brand up and building your business and figuring out all of the answers to these questions, they can help to give you a little bit of a guide and will help you out in the end. So that's it today. Thank you to Pete and Catherine and Meredith. And thanks for coming. Thank you. Everybody.